Good morning, church. Yeah, good morning. Okay, a little bit more vibrant, right? Because it's Sabbath, right? I lo do you love Sabbath? I love Sabbath. Okay, so good morning, church. Yes, right? It's good. It's good to be in church here on Sabbath morning. I want to welcome uh, all of our church uh, here, a part of our faith community, all of our friends who are visiting from out of town. We are celebrating the Ohio Conference Elementary Music Festival, right? So all of everyone who is here for that event, thank you so much for being here to worship with us for community and to celebrate our King and our God, Jesus, uh, together on Sabbath. So um, yeah, so it's good. So so I'm just going to say a quick word of prayer and then ask you uh, a question uh, to talk about with your friends and family and the people sitting around you. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for Sabbath and for church and for community and this opportunity that we do have to kind of rest and get away and escape from all of the craziness of life and just be together and focus on the things that are really important, like each other, relationships, our family, but most importantly, you. So Father, you've blessed this experience, this church and all the things that we do here um, countless times. We pray that your spirit is here and that you lead and guide and walk with us with everything that happens uh, in the next few minutes. So thank you, God, for being so good. It's our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. So I asked the, the high school kids about an hour ago, and I want, I'm interested in hearing what you guys would say. If you could only eat one meal, just one, for the rest of your life, right? So every meal, this is the only thing you would ever eat for the rest of your life. Tell the people around you, what would that one single meal be? What would you choose to eat for the rest of your life? Just that one thing. Good morning, church family. Good morning, church family. Happy. Happy Sabbath. Thank you so much for being here and being a part of this faith community of our church to worship together. On behalf of the pastoral staff, I just want to say thank you, right? I've been here about a year and a half and we do a lot. And a lot of the things that we do as a church and as a faith community, it's really fun and it's exciting and it's engaging but we could never do these things without each other. And so I just wanna take a quick moment and say thank you, thank you church. Thank you for all that you do to make this such a great church, such a great faith community to be a part of. Thank you for what you are doing and thank you so much for what you will continue to do to support the ministries that we have going on either financially or with your time or your energy or even just your presence because we do recognize we do a lot and it's nothing without you. So thank you for being a part of our great church. So here's what's coming up in the next few weeks. Starting today at 3.30 here in the sanctuary is the Ohio Conference Middle School Choir Festival Concert. It's gonna be crazy fun, 3.30 in the sanctuary. Tomorrow, April 8th, we are having a church work bee. And if you're anything like me at all, and you just think about this idea of a church work bee, you're like, ugh, really? I have to be at the church for 40 hours cleaning. No, it's nothing like that. We recognize that you are busy people. We wanna protect your time, especially over the weekend, but we definitely, as a church, need your help. So from nine to 12, and that's it, just from nine to 12, tomorrow here at the church, we will have a work bee. Look around, we wanna to continue to improve our church to make it cleaner, less cluttered, not only to connect with each other, but most importantly, to connect to God. So please come be a part of the Work Bee from nine to 12 tomorrow. In addition to the Work Bee tomorrow, there is also the Kettering College 5K run that I know is gonna be super fun. And all of you who have signed up for that, woohoo, it's gonna be great. For the last year and a half, we have partnered with the Potter's House down in West Dayton, building a partnership and the collaboration to meet the needs of people. And so far we have done a lot for that community and for those people and all of you who have participated in this, thank you again so much for being a part of this service. Here's the exciting thing, we're doing it again. 
Next Saturday is the block party down at the Potter's house. We would love for you to join us and to be a part of this amazing ministry. So in order to do that, two options. One, you can go online at our church website, or you can go to the back information desk and register there. So if you are able to join us and be a part of the block party next Saturday afternoon, that is fantastic. If you cannot, but you still want to be a part of this epic opportunity to minister and serve, you can donate diapers and baby wipes. And finally, in two weeks, on April 22, we are having our church town hall meeting. It will begin at 8.30 in the morning with breakfast. Your pastors, yes, us, we are going to make breakfast for you. Hopefully you don't get sick. After breakfast, we will then transition into our town hall. It's really important where we come together, vision, listen to each other, and really get on the same page as far as where we are, who we are, and where we are going together as a church family. Town hall, April 22, starting at 8.30 in the morning. And then after our church town hall, we will be transitioning to our church garage sale starting at 11 a.m. If you would like more information as to the details of the garage sale, go ahead and see Pastor Alex. My name is Jason Calvert, and this is Kettering Life. Well, good morning, church. Before we get going on our to serve, um, I want to clarify, we, we recognized or discovered kind of late yesterday afternoon that we cannot have our town hall meeting on April 22. We will have it on May 12 and more details will be given. The garage sale, however, will still be on April 22. So if you marked your bulletin for that garage sale April 22, we will still have that. Thank you, Scotty, for being up here with me. This is my friend, Scott Blackburn, and he helps with our block party, and he is awesome. So I wanna ask you a few questions. Um, the, the block party that Pastor Jason mentioned, what is it? It is a time for us to go to West Dayton to help those who are much less fortunate than we are. They, by and large, are uneducated, they have little hope in their community, but they are served by an awesome bishop and a team of pastors that are trying to help them get back to a place where they can be more educated, have food, diapers, clothes, necessities, and we're a big part of that. So we need all of you to come out there and be a part of it. Yeah, and so we're really excited. What, we, what happened was this partnership with the Potter's House, with the Bishop and the Potter's House, is that they said what we really need to do is educate this community about health, uh, basic things, hygiene, um, blood sugars, a lot of that kind of thing. And the network said, you know what, well, we want to be a part of that. We're excited about the partnership of Grandview and Cassano. So we together, the, the Kettering Seventh-day Adventist Church, uh, Kettering College, the Kettering Health Network, we are all going to the Potter's House next Sabbath afternoon to really make a difference in the community. What uh, are some of the things we're giving them? Do you know? Well, in addition to just health things, to get them to come out. The people that come to the health block party tend to be people who are within eyesight of the church that we do this at. So Alex puts a bouncy house there in plain view where everyone can see it. We cook hamburgers, hot dogs, <laughs> veggie links. <I> yeah. Um, <laughs> and we give away diapers, we give away wipes. We have heard that, you know, some people there in the community can't play their electric bill, so they end up using the wipes basically for showers. And it's huge, it's things we don't even think about, most of us in this community, but it's a place where we can be a real blessing. All we have to do is show up for four hours on Sabbath. Yes, and there's lots of things that are happening. A, an organization called Shoe for the Shoeless is coming, and they're going to hand out shoes to everyone. The Good Neighbor House is going to be there. They're going to be handing out clothes and food and clothing, as well as shoe, as well as flip flops. And they're going to be teaching vegetarian cooking class. I mean, this is a huge event. We're hoping to affect more than the 800 we did last year. We're hoping to really make an impact on a community. First, we got to meet their needs. 
then we can tell them about Jesus. And that's really what we're doing next weekend. So if you haven't signed up, you can go, like was mentioned earlier, to our website and do it. Scotty, are you excited? Of course. <laughs> I'm always excited about this event. What was your favorite part about the Potter's House? I think my favorite... You didn't know I was going to ask you yeah, questions. Yeah, I didn't know right? you were going to ask me a question. I think my favorite part was um, just getting to know the Potter's House church members because we worked side by side with them. And I'm thinking of, you know, Veronica and Alonzo. I mean, these wonderful people who are on fire for Jesus in this community that we got to partner with. I loved that. And I got to be honest, I really loved the part where at the very end of the day, they did a very open, and I'm, I'm being honest here, they did, an, they did a dance. Now, we might call it a march, because it was kind of like a march, like the good old times when we would have a march. And everybody, I mean, it was hundreds of people doing this wonderful march that was out there. It was just phenomenal. It was such a blessing to see our church members, our college students, our network people, all coming together with a community. All of it was my favorite. All of it was my favorite. If you come, if you sign up and come, I guarantee you, you will have a good time. We had 200 volunteers. 200 volunteers. And we and need that From money. our, from Kettering Church and Kettering Network, the Potter's House had probably an additional 60 or 70, and not a single person left early. We all had a great time. You will too. Yeah. So sign up, sign up in the back, get out your smartphone right now. Oh, not, well, Carl's preaching. <laughs> as soon as you can, sign up. <laughs> Thank you, Scott. I appreciate it. All right. At this time, I'm going to invite um, Chuck and April, Bliss and Liam, Robina to come, and all of the family that is here, because we are going to dedicate a sweet little young man. So all of the family that's going to join us on the platform, we invite you to make your way forward. They have quite a bit of family, and you'll see, you'll recognize many of the family members because they are members of our church, and you will recognize um, some of the family members because they are involved up front in our church, and we're just so glad you're here. Hi, Liam. Now, my understanding is that Liam just turned a year old three weeks ago. Four weeks ago, March 20, so a couple weeks ago, and we're delighted that he's here, and Chuck and April are here with, with Bliss, big sister. This morning, I want to give this little gift to you. This is a quilt that is made by the ladies of our church. It's a gift, so when you're wrapping this little guy or covering him with this wonderful quilt, you'll remember the church family wraps our love around you as well. And Liam, the name Liam, it means warrior, protector. And even though he's the little brother, maybe he'll be warrior and protector of mom and sis, yeah? Will Liam come with me while I pray? Will you come with me? Awesome. Thank you. All right. Well, we're going to have a word of prayer. But before we do, we have lots of family. Family. Is this all family that are local? Yes, all the family that is local. So family, we invite you. We're so glad you're here. And let's pray. Liam, you're going to pray with me, buddy? All right, let's pray. Gracious Father, we think of Jesus' words that said, have the children come to me. Father, Chuck and April this morning have answered that call, and they bring Liam before you. This morning they bring him here to say, that they are dedicating themselves to teaching Liam about Jesus. We dedicate this sweet boy, asking, Father, that you will grow him into a warrior for Jesus, that he will be a protector of all that is good and that is right, and, Father, that he will know you intimately. Father, what we pray for is that you save our children for your kingdom. We pray believing and trusting in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you, family. You may be seated while Grandpa sings a song. God wants each one of us so much to follow him throughout our lives. And so as I sing this song to Liam and for Liam this morning, 
I would ask and invite you to think of this song as your prayer for all of our children, that they will follow God their whole life long. As we continue. 
continue in worship. We can stand and sing together. Joyful, joyful, we adore thee. seated as we continue in worship we join the beings we read about in revelation chapter 4 the these beings that are before the throne of god and that cry out over and over it says their praises never stop as they cry out holy 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 is the lord god almighty who was who is who is to come holy
invite all the children to go out and start collecting all those dollar bills that the adults are going to hand to you for children's offering. This morning, children, I'm going to tell you a story about Jackie, Jackie and Judy. <laughs> Not the Jackie and Judy you know from the church, another Jackie and Judy. They were sisters, and Judy had gone into the kitchen, and she went over to the cookie jar. She opened the cookie jar, and she took out a cookie. She took out a cookie, put the cookie jar lid back on, and started to eat it. And sister came running and said, ha ha, I caught you. I'm going to tell mom, I'm going to tell mom, I'm going to tell mom that you're eating a cookie between meals and you're not supposed to. Judy was red and mouth full with the cookies and crumbs. She was caught in the middle of eating a cookie between meals, eating sugar without permission. I mean, all kinds of rules. She was breaking. Well, as she was standing there thinking, what do I do, what do I do? And Jackie was getting ready to scream, Ma! And she was saying, I'm telling, I'm telling. <gasps> Suddenly, Judy thought, oh, wait a minute. If you tell Mom, I'm going to tell her that you had one yesterday. Ha, <laughs> ha, Wait, you saw me do that? Yeah. You stole a cookie yesterday. I saw you. Oh, man. It's so easy to point out the mistakes other people make. And you know, in the story that Pastor Carl is going to talk about today, he's going to talk about the fact that there were a bunch of men with rocks in their hands and they were getting ready to throw the rocks on a woman who had made a big bad mistake but the story doesn't end like that the story ends with jesus crouching down to the sand how many of you have ever made a mistake be honest oh look at all the adults raising their hands mm -hmm. Yeah, we've made mistakes. There's a yucky word. We call them sins. Sometimes we've made them knowing that we were doing something wrong. Sometimes we didn't mean to. All of us have made mistakes. 
So I want all of you to come to the sand troughs. Come on, kiddos. Come to the sand trough, and I want you to make a face, or you can write a mistake that you know that made Jesus sad. Come on, you can come around. Come on over to this side. Go ahead and write a mistake. Something that you know. You guys want to come? You don't have to, but you can. And now, now that you've written a mistake or a smiley, I mean an upside down smiley face, a frowny face, Nico's going to take this wooden anvil. Wait, guys, don't miss this. Come. And look what Jesus does. He comes. All right, take your fingers away. He comes and he erases our mistakes. How do we call that when Jesus erases our mistakes? What do we call that? Forgiveness. You're right. It's forgiveness. He forgives us. And instead of God using a rock to say, you did wrong, he comes and he wipes away our sins and he forgives us. Listen in the story as Pastor Carl talks about being sand riders, rock throwers, and we want to be like Jesus who forgives. You've been wonderful listeners. You can go back to your seats. Thank you. Good morning, Kettering Seventh day Adventist Church. It's good. To, well, actually, no, it is morning in California, but not now. It's afternoon. That's right. We start a little later than here. Good afternoon, Kettering Seventh day Adventist Church. And everybody that's watching on live streaming, it's good to see everybody. You want to know what local church budget does? Local church budget pays for ministry. I want you to look at these young people. This is our ministry, amen? So I want you to think as you are giving today, I want you to think about the ministry that this amazing church gives to not only our young people, but the community and so many others from the birth all the way up until the very last days, this church gives ministry to all. Can we say amen to that? So whenever you're thinking about giving your offering, I want you to think about what that ministry means to you as the deacons and deaconesses come and collect the offering right now. Uh, let's bow our heads for prayer. Dear Jesus in heaven, thank you so much for giving us the most amazing gift of all, and that is you. You have came down to this earth to give your blood and sacrifice for us to have eternal life with you, and we are so grateful. God, this little gift that we are giving back is but a small portion of what you have given us, not even a, a blip on the radar, but God, I know that you can take this, this gift that we are giving to you and multiply it in a meaningful and powerful way. Thank you for the Kettering SDA Church, and thank you for all the, the members of this church and the community, and help whatever Whatever it is that we give today, bless this community in a mighty and powerful way. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, we all say, amen.
Today's scripture comes from John 8, verse 1 through 11. But Jesus went to the Mountain of Olives. At dawn, he appeared again in the temple courts, where all the people gathered around him, and he sat down to teach them. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman caught in adultery. They made her stand before the group and said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. In the law, Moses commanded us to stone such a woman. Now, what do you say? They were using this as a question. This they were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing him. But, but Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. When they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, "Let any one of you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her." Again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. At this, those who heard began to go away one at a time, the older ones first, until only Jesus was left with the woman still standing there. Jesus straightened up and asked her, Woman, where are they? Has no one commanded you? No one, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. Now go and leave your life of sin. I'd like to invite all who are able to join me in kneeling as we pray together. <clears throat> God, it is with gratitude that we witness these beautiful children singing and our hearts sing with them. And uh, we recognize that the very breath that we have is a gift, that our presence here with you is a gift. And so we thank you for it. And we are mindful this morning as we think about this story of scripture that we are this woman caught in our own web of sin, whatever it is, in James 5, you have asked us to come together confessing our sin and be healed. And so jointly as a congregation, we lift our voice to you and we confess that we are caught. And it is only in your presence that we have hope. And so we cling to that hope and we cling to your grace and we cling to your forgiveness so that we can go out into this community, community and share the healing that you've given us. Give us that energy. Give us that capability, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Many, many years ago, back when I was the age of many of our young musicians here with us today, we are so delighted that you are with us. Thank you for your amazing music. We're just so glad that you're here. Well, back when I was the age of some of you, seventh grade, after a church service, a deacon cornered me in the church and said, Carl, I had a surreal dream last night. It was very strange. I dreamed that I was in church, but when your father stood up to preach his sermon, instead, you stood up and you preached the most amazing sermon I've ever heard. Well, I, I laughed uncomfortably, and then he got serious and said, no, I'm going to ask your dad if he would let you preach one week. 
Next thing I knew, a few weeks later, I was standing behind the pulpit of that local church preaching my very first sermon. After the service, that same deacon cornered me and said, just like I dreamed, that was the greatest sermon ever preached in the history of humankind. It was amazing. Now, before we get caught up in all the hyperbole, I have to tell you, just a few years ago, I happened across the manuscript that I used in that sermon. And I have to tell you, I blushed in embarrassment. If you think my sermons are bad and boring and disjointed now, it could be a whole lot worse, trust me. But I've often wondered how pivotal that conversation perhaps was in my own spiritual journey, in my own career choice. No doubt we can all think of life-altering conversations like that, where you reflect and wonder, how did that change the trajectory of my life. Well, today we begin a brand new five week series called Encounters. And together we're going to be studying some of these life altering conversations that Jesus had with different people. One of the reasons I love this series is because it allows me to do one of my favorite pastimes of all time eavesdrop. We'll be listening in on conversations between Jesus and different people. And so just this week, I was at Dorothy Lane Market at the deli, and I started preparing for this series. Sat next to uh, several tables that they had pulled together, a large group of young women, and I leaned into it so that I could eavesdrop, just preparing. For this series, you realize I'm just using my spiritual gift of eavesdropping so that I could teach all of you. And the one woman said to another young lady, oh, Sheila, you, you got to tell us all the gory details of the proposal. And it was amazing, especially the part about where he dropped the ring in the mud and panicked, thinking that maybe he lost his investment. Isn't eavesdropping just the best? Amen? I love eavesdropping. And so, over the next five weeks, that's what we're going to do around here, beginning today with a conversation that Jesus had with a woman caught on death row. John, chapter 8, beginning verse 1, if you have the outline in your bulletin or you want to turn in your Bible, John, chapter 8. Now, we note that this chapter begins with religious leaders wanting to stone a woman. The chapter ends with religious leaders wanting to stone Jesus. So the book ends of this chapter, all about stoning. We begin verse 1. Text tells us, Jesus went to the Mount of Olives, at dawn he appeared again in the temple courts where all the people gathered around him and he sat down to teach them. Now John is intentional about including this detail, how Jesus sat down, indicating that this is not some private conversation behind closed doors, but rather in Bible times when a rabbi wanted to teach in a public setting such as this, when a preacher was ready to preach his sermon, in Bible times, the teacher would sit down and everybody else would stand up. So I believe in the Bible. And so today, I'm going to sit down and see what this allowed for back in Bible times was for the teacher to just ramble on and on and on and on, and he would never get tired while everybody had to stand. So like I say, I believe in the Bible. I'm going to sit. 
it, and if you don't believe in the Bible, you just sit in your, un there we go, thank you. All right, we'll see how long this, uh, you can sit down, but thank you. Yeah. <laughs> the teachers of the law and the Pharisees, brought in a woman caught in adultery. Now, just this verse, rich with all kinds of details that we could delve into if we had the time. This phrase, caught in the act, taken from Jewish law, Deuteronomy 19 and the Mishnah. But understand, if you go back to the law, they would have to have several witnesses. But instead, they bring this woman, okay? So several witnesses suggests that this is a premeditated sting. You don't just walk down the street and stumble across a couple committing adultery. No, that happens behind closed blinds and sleazy hotels, right? but they were premeditated in this. They wanted to catch this woman. Moreover, that phrase, caught in the act of adultery, if they were to follow the law, they would have insisted that the man come with her. And according to the Jewish codified law, the Mishnah, it says if a man were caught in the act of adultery, he is to be enclosed in dung up to his knees, a soft towel set within a rough towel is to be placed around his neck in order that no mark be made, for the punishment is God's punishment. Then one man draws in one direction and another in the other direction until he be dead. So they would put a rope around the neck and they would suffocate him to death in public. But of course, they are not interested in carrying out the details of the law. What they want to do is trap Jesus. They made her stand before the group and said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. There's that phrase again. In the law, Moses, us, Moses commanded us to stone such a woman. So here you have the church leaders, for heaven's sake, locked and loaded, holding their stones, ready to put this woman to death. It's sad to think about these church leaders who we can only presume at one point in their own spiritual journeys, they must have been tender and broken before God. But now we see them standing calloused, cold, ready to stone this woman. John Ortberg writes, I've been in church my whole life, and I love the church. I can relate. But I wonder, why do churches seem to produce so many stone throwers? In the church where I grew up, were so many people who were just cold. They didn't dance. They didn't laugh. They had so little capacity for loving and embracing people. They enjoyed passing judgment on the spiritually inferior among them. Somebody's kid was a little wild, picked up that stone. Somebody's marriage wasn't working very well. They picked up a stone. The music minister chooses the wrong kind of song and plays it too loudly. They pick up a stone. Somebody crosses a line, violates a code, dresses the wrong way, has a problem, word spreads, and the quote, saints pick up their stones. And they ask, now what do you say? They were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing him. Because, see, now they finally have this Jewish itinerant preacher trap. No matter what Jesus says, they finally got him. 
Because if he says, stone her, then he's going up against the Roman law. He can't say that. But then if he says, well, don't stone her, then he's pitting himself up against the law of Moses. He definitely can't go there. Finally, they got this guy. But Jesus bent down. He started to write on the ground with his finger. And when they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, let any one of you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. He who is without sin, let him be the first to throw a stone. I asked our head elder and a couple of other people, hey, should I tell, I can't read this story without thinking of the very first time when I discovered this verse in the Bible. I had never heard of it before. And because I've told the story a couple of times around here, I said, but we got all of these young people. They haven't heard my story when I wasn't much older than they are when I first learned this verse. And just like that, it became my favorite verse in Scripture. And they said, yeah, just tell the story. First service didn't get the story just you because you're special. So I was a junior at the other SVA, Shenandoah Valley Academy in Newmarket, Virginia, very small town. So you wouldn't think that students could get into much trouble in a small town like that, right? Night before home leave, word got out, big party going down up in Nestler's room. So after the lights went out in the dorm, we snuck up to the third floor, walked into a candlelit casino. The agenda that night, I did not know this, was penny poker. I had never played poker before. I guess that's why parents invest lots of money to send them to conservative Adventist schools so that we can learn some of these important life skills, right? Now, you call it beginner's luck, you call it fate, call it whatever you want. All I know is by 3 o'clock in the morning, I was doing really well. I was sitting behind a mountain of pennies. I still, to this day, remember wondering, does God expect me to pay tithe on my windfall, right? Is some of the ethical questions you grapple with in academy. Well, by 3 o'clock in the morning, we were getting very hungry, but in a town the size of Newmarket, you can't just order in pizza, so you have to be a little more creative. Somebody suggested, I know, let's raid the cafeteria. A couple guys snuck out of the dorm, raced across campus, let themselves in through a window at the cafeteria. When they got inside, they heard the strangest sound. Peeking around the corner in the pantry, there they discover the vice principal, Mr. Strickland. He was determined to catch all of these kids who kept breaking into the cafeteria. The problem was he was much too heavy of a sleeper to pull off this sting. So while he snored, they literally passed chocolate eclairs right over his nose, <laughs> along with Doritos and donuts. And I mean, they came back to the dorm room. We enjoyed a feast that defies the senses. A few years ago, I happened into Mr. Strickland, and I asked him, hey, do you re Oh, yes, I remember. The, I remember the story well. He said, you can tell the story as much as you like, and I have told it more than any other story I have. Over the last many years, I tell it all. It's my signature story. He said, you tell it all you want. And they said, by the way, Hafner, you realize, don't you? You boys never would have been caught had you just kept your big mouths shut. Which, of course, that's true. I understand that, but a story that good, come on, you don't keep it to yourself. We told a few people, 
told a few others, who told still others. Next thing we knew, all of us were sitting outside of the principal's office, waiting our turn one by one to go in and speak to the disciplinary committee. I went in, Nessa went in, Kevin went in, we all went in. Last kid to go in was Jeff. After he had shared his rendition of the story, Principal peered over his big mahogany desk, looking over his glasses. He growled, is there anything else, young man, you want to say before we punish the whole lot of you? And it was in that moment that Jeff quoted John chapter 8, verse 7. <laughs> Let he who is without sin <laughs> cast the first stone. The boy's dean fell off his chair. He was laughing so hard. And they barely punished us at all. So you understand why to this day it's my favorite verse in the whole Bible. And again, Jesus stooped down, and he wrote on the ground. What do you suppose he wrote? Of course, <laughs> tradition has it that he started to sketch out the sins of the accusers. And there is evidence for that in the original text, as the Greek word for to write is graphian. Here, that's not the word. It's actually katagraphian. In other words, to write against someone. That this, those who heard began to go away one at a time. And this has always been a very fascinating detail in the story that John includes. They began to slink away. Notice, the older ones first. In other words, it was the GC officers, it was the pastors, it was the spiritually mature. That's what it's talking about. The religious leaders, and oh, how I can relate to this detail of the story. Because I always feel really uncomfortable with the notion of standing in front of anybody, telling them how they ought to live and love like Jesus, because I know how often I fail to do just that. I understand my own twisted motives, my own dark thoughts. And so for me to preach to people and say things like, you ought to be kind and tender-hearted to your kids, to your spouse. Well, I've never been real comfortable with that because my kids, my spouse, they'll tell you, he's not always kind. <laughs> he's not always tender-hearted. Like, do you need an example? I got a lot of them. <laughs> I remember one time, my wife and I were having a major disagreement. I mean, we were yelling at each other. I got so angry. I took the cordless phone, slammed it on the carpet. It bounced back up. No kidding. In the pinnacle of its ascent, it rang. So here, here we are, yelling at you, well, if you had said that, well, if you hadn't had done, and ring, and then it's always, hello, <laughs> Pastor Hafner speaking. <laughs> and of course, it's some woman in the church who's saying, hey, my husband and I are having marriage issues. Do you do marital counseling? And I want to say, no, I don't. I need my own marital. I got my own issues. I mean, the older ones, the spiritually mature, the pastors, the conference administrators, they get it. When Jesus starts exposing their shortcomings, they can't get out of there fast enough. Because we're all a group of messed up, broken people, right? All of us. So I get this, how the older ones, they just want to get out of there until only Jesus was left with this woman still 
standing there. Never in the history of humankind have two more diverse people stood eye to eye, a man and a woman, one who has never sinned and one who was caught in the very act of sin that day. You have the Son of God and a cheating spouse standing eye to eye. Jesus straightened up and asked her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. Now, it's interesting because in that crowd that wanted to condemn her, nobody could speak. Nobody in the crowd could condemn her. The only one qualified to condemn her wouldn't. He says, neither do I condemn you. And then go now and leave your life of sin. In case you're a little nervous that Jesus seems soft on sin in the story, that he's too accepting, he's too forgiving, understand, he calls her to a better way of life. He says, you don't have to be enslaved any longer. You, you, you can experience kingdom life. Go and leave this foolishness. Leave your life of sin. And for those of us gathered around this story in Scripture, studying the ways and the life and the thoughts of Jesus, we often gather around the mantra, our mission to live and to love like Jesus. And as we read a story like this in our local church here, we, we have to ask, so what does that look like? It was this passage, this story, that we used the very first Sabbath I preached here 11 years ago when I came to pastor at this church. And then we had a booster a few years back just to remind ourselves, but we started out saying, this is what we want to live like. And so we handed out a bookmark that week with a specific prayer. Then, a few years ago, we handed out another bookmark. So every day as I sit down at my desk, under the glass on top of my desk, I have those two bookmarks to remind me to keep praying the prayer that comes out of this story. God, help me to model the non-judgmental love of Jesus. The Pharisees were so quick to condemn and judge, but... We read this story as a local congregation. We say, we, we, we want to live and love people like Jesus did. Help me to model that kind of non-judgmental acceptance of others. And then the second part of that prayer, God, help me to put relationships over rules. The Pharisees were so quick to go to their law book to throw the rules at her, but in the way Jesus interacts with her, it's clear that the woman is way more important than the rules. And so that's a daily prayer of mine. God, today, help me to put people above policies. And then finally, God, the third part of that prayer, transform me into the likeness and character of Jesus. Help me to go now and sin no more. Help me to become more like Jesus. Ellen White tells us on this story that this woman became one of his most repentant followers, one of his most effective disciples. And so that's my prayer. God, transform me into the ways of Jesus, into the life of Jesus. Paul Herbert is a judge up in Columbus, Ohio, and he puts skin on this story for us. 
Because talking about life-altering conversations, it is this conversation that he has studied at length, at depth, that has changed his life in some fairly dramatic ways. Judge Herbert sees a steady stream of young women, victims of domestic violence come through his courtroom. And he noticed a cycle, how they just keep coming back and coming back through his courtroom. And so he made this story, this conversation, a matter of deep prayer. Part of his prayer, he writes, is to say, Dear God, I realize that being a judge is a very unique position. Not many people get this opportunity. Can you show me some way that I could be significant for you in my work? And shortly after starting to pray this prayer, the sheriff brought in a woman caught in adultery, and like the accusers in the story, they throw, him, throw her at his feet, and they say, okay, well, this is what the law says. What do you want us to do with her, judge? And judge Herbert finds himself in that uncomfortable role of Jesus in the story. What's he going to do with her? And so he started to do some study, and he said, I discovered around 87% of prostitutes are abused, typically around the age of eight. They often start using drugs to deal with the trauma around age 12. 87% almost all of them. The girls run away from home or foster care and are dragged by predatory pimps into the commercial sex trade. And so Judge Herbert decided, we've got to do something to help these young women who are victims. And rather than just see them every few years or few months in my courtroom, what can we do to help them go and leave this life? How can we give them freedom? And so he started a program called CATCH. It's an acronym. stands for Changing Attitudes to Changing Habits. And that's the key. He said, you got to help them to change habits. And so he says, prior to the program, these women simply cycled in and out of jail. But through this two-year program, women convicted of prostitution receive drug treatment, counseling, their movements are monitored electronically, they offer support regularly to each other, and they meet with Judge Herbert every single week for two years. Don't just leave them out on, the own, on their own, but to say, we can help you. What's most interesting about his story, I think, he too locked onto that part. The older ones first. And listen to what the judge writes. He says, um, the Holy Spirit continues to reveal how much I have been forgiven and how similar I am to the individuals that come before me. And he shares all these stories of these women whose lives have been radically changed. But he says, I relate to every single one of them. He says, that's really hard for me to say because my job is to be the judge. But the further I go along in my faith, the more I realize that I am just like every one of them. And that makes me more understanding, more kind, more merciful. Oh, that God would transform this church to be more understanding, more kind, more merciful. In the name of Jesus, amen.
preaching in a tweet, the whole sermon in 280 characters or less. Here it is. God help us. Model your non-judgmental love to be acceptance magnets rather than stone throwers, to value relationships over rules as we grow together to live and to love like Jesus in his name.